Welcome. Uh, this is our week three of the study in Genesis, um, our study on Joseph. Uh, and this morning I'll be reading chapter 39 uh, in Genesis. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant, whom you have brought among us, came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Cassandra, for opening and for reading that passage. I uh, agree heartily with uh, Cassandra how good it is to see people in person instead of the online studies. Recently, I had the opportunity to watch a street artist draw a woman's portrait. I stood behind him and looked over his shoulder as he began to sketch, sketch the outline of her face. And she was fair-skinned and had blonde hair, and so I was surprised at the dark colors he chose to use. He outlined in black, added some deep red, and then dark brown. These certainly didn't look to me like they would be appropriate for an accurate finished portrait of this beautiful woman. But in fact, he went on, and it did turn out to be quite an accurate portrait and a beautiful finished product. So as we read this part of Joseph's story, uh, it doesn't look to us like God's good hand is at work at this time. There's a lot of dark colors, a lot of uh, deep shades, and even though there's some brighter tones mixed in, there's certainly harsh tones in the drawing that's happening. I thought to help us learn uh, how to process this chapter, we could ask two questions. One is, where is Joseph in this story? And the other is, where is God in this story? So first of all, where is Joseph? Well, Joseph, we read, is in Egypt, a civilization in North Africa. And throughout its ancient history, Egypt went through stable and unstable times. But during Joseph's lifetime, it was a very strong and powerful kingdom. Going to Egypt could have been an exciting experience for a young boy like Joseph who grew up somewhere in the outback uh, as a shepherd. 
But Joseph, the Bible tells us, was brought down to Egypt against his will and was bought as a slave. Uh, not so much excitement or adventure, but really deep pain, so much loss and such humiliation and awful degradation. degradation. I think it's important for us, really at the start of the story, to remember that Joseph deeply felt all the abuse and mistreatment and injustice against him. We can sometimes read the stories in the Bible or hear stories of people of faith and think that because they respond and live in such a godly way, well, they don't really feel it as deeply as maybe I would in that circumstance. God doesn't actually describe Joseph's feelings in this chapter, but if we go to chapter 42, verse 21, we hear, overhear a conversation between his brothers, and they say to each other, we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. Joseph suffered deep agony over the hardships he encountered, which makes this story all the more profound when we see how he handled himself in those circumstances. Understanding something of the depths to which Joseph had sunk in terms of uh, status and belonging and abuse makes it all the more surprising that when Joseph was in Egypt, in slavery, he actually landed in success. He saved himself well, he pr pr proved himself reliable, faithful, and diligent, and soon he was in success in terms of the context in which he was, which was manager of Potiphar's house. Although we've said that Joseph suffered from his adversity, it's remarkably, remarkable that we don't see any bitterness in Joseph. We would feel sympathetic and understanding, wouldn't we, if we did see bitterness? Joseph could have agonized over the circumstances that happened to conspire to bring him to Egypt and go on over and over in his mind why this happened, and if only I hadn't this, or if only they hadn't that, or if the timing had been different. Bitterness can cripple and destroy. But Joseph didn't have bitterness, and so instead he was diligent and faithful to his master. He was so good at his job that Potiphar left everything to Joseph and didn't worry about anything except for what he ate. Potiphar's success was Joseph's success. And then Joseph found himself in temptation. It could be easy again for us to think that because he handled it so well, it really wasn't that tempting for him. But remember, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It's interesting that he took after his mother because in Genesis 29, verse 17, it uses those exact words to describe Rachel. Joseph was healthy, and a healthy young man would have healthy and strong hormones and desires. That's God's design. And so um, <clears throat> it was a real temptation for a lonely, healthy young man. But Joseph resisted. And Joseph's behavior in the face of this strong temptation when no one in his family could see him and no one of his faith was around to watch shows that Joseph lived his days in the presence of his God. He was conscious that God saw him and noticed him. And so as Potiphar's wife tried to entice him to sin, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? After a long time of prodding Joseph to lie with her, Potiphar's wife finally found what seemed like the perfect opportunity for an exciting sexual uh, connection with Joseph, and so she grabbed his coat to draw her, him to her. And so as Joseph fled, he left behind his coat, and that's what was used as evidence in her lie that she told. Now, when you read about Joseph's coat being used in a lie, does that ring a bell? Remember his other coat and the lie that it used? I just encourage you, in, as you go forward in this study, to watch the coats or, coats or the garments that Joseph wears because God uses them to illustrate where Joseph is at in this story. There are two important th truths that I think would be helpful for us to take note of uh, about temptation and how to resist and stand strong in the face of temptation. This world is so full of many allurements and seductions. We're all faced with temptations. And so it's helpful to look at some lessons from Joseph. First of all, we'll notice that Joseph called sin what it was. He said, how can I do this great wickedness? To have victory over temptation uh, with the sins that come to us, we have to learn to call them what they are. A sexual affair isn't love. The lie isn't a harmless way to avoid conflict. Uh, dishonoring parents isn't just finding my own way. The words that destroy a person aren't just being honest, and theft isn't just doing what you have to to get by. These things are wickedness and they're sin against God. They're not popular words today to use, and we often shy away from using them 
Yet, in order to be able to resist temptation, we have to call sin what it is and not find a way to rationalize it. Secondly, we need to cultivate a sensitive God consciousness, a moment-by-moment awareness that God is near, that he sees, and it does matter to him what I do in my life. Living our lives daily in the presence of God and with honesty can help us resist many temptations which confront us. Joseph's response to temptation stands in vivid contrast to that of his brother Judah. We read his story in chapter 38, and we see how he responded to lusts and how he handled his desires. We're not taking a look at that closely uh, in this part of the study, but we encourage you to look in your study guide at a link for a message that Ellen Mackery did in the spring on chapter 38. The point is that Joseph was suffering from terrible inju- abuse and injustice, and yet he continued to live with integrity in the presence of his God. By contrast, Judah, who had committed the terrible abuse and was actually the ringleader among his brethren, he was the one that convinced them to sell Joseph into slavery. Jo- Judah was living free. At least he was free in his status. But scripture shows us that he was actually helplessly captive to his own sexual sinful lusts. In his freedom, Joseph Judah did what he was inclined to do, and that was to dishonor and defraud his sister, his daughter-in-law of what was rightfully due to her, and he also satisfied his sexual desires in a despicable way. In our culture today, it seems like uh, everyone understands freedom as having the ability to get what you want and satisfy your desires. Most of our advertising affirms us and urges us to do what we can to satisfy our cravings. But we can be blinded to the reality that sinful indulgences are actually evidence of bondage of the worst kind. It's bondage to the evil one, the enemy, who comes to kill and steal and destroy. Sinful indulgence kills and steals and destroys, that's sure, in God's word. And you've probably seen that in lives around you, or maybe you've even experienced that sad reality at some point in your own life. God's commands and his precepts and his will are always given to set us truly free to live the abundant life designed by God for us to live. Sin has marred us and distorted the way God made us to be and in the beauty, in the beauty of his own design, and only deliverance from this sin can truly set us free. God provides this deliverance through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree and by his resurrection won the victory over sin and death. Now, if you feel in your heart convicted that maybe you've lived like Judah in some ways more than like Joseph in the face of temptation and your sin is pressing down on your conscience and bringing hopelessness and despair, please take heart. Judah's story isn't over. God is always there with hope in every story, and God does have good plans for Judah. We're just in chapter 38 with his story now, but if we look ahead, we'll see that God used this time in Judah's life where he yielded to his sinful passions and suffered consequences. God used that to make Judah repent and change. And we know this because as the story unfolds, we're going to see a very, very different Judah who later went down to Egypt than the one who chose to sell Joseph to the, uh, to the slave traders. A changed and repentant Judah became a beautiful part of God's story of reconciliation and redemption in Judah's sto- Joseph's story. The blessings that came after Judah repented and went, beyond, went far beyond his time, and God gave him the honor to be the one who was an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Judah's story gets wrapped into God's great story of grace in beautiful ways. Because God is always eager and ready to welcome and forgive any one of us who acknowledges our sin and uh, recognizes God's righteousness and comes to God for the cleansing that only he can give. So going back to chapter 39, we see that Joseph chose to honor his God and resist temptation. So at this point, we're thinking, wow, way to go, Joseph, you're in success, and you really did well in that battle against sin, and so now God's going to reward him but not. That's not what happens. Uh, It's disturbing to us to read that he actually lands in prison and God does nothing to intervene with this hideous lie that Potiphar's wife told. Prisons were rare rare in the ancient world, but Egypt was one of the civilizations who did use them 
uh, to deal with issues of crime and justice. In this case, we know Joseph suffered from a huge injustice, and uh, this is a consequence of a terrible lie that was told against him. But yet, once again, Joseph found himself in success. He quickly rose to prominence in the prison because of his faithfulness and his willingness to work and his reliable character. And soon the prison keeper caused him to be given charge of all the prisoners, and he was responsible for everything that was done in that place. Even though Joseph was now only managing a prison, this was still an honor in that setting, and it included privileges associated with that position. Yet it seems obvious, of course, that Joseph, like all slaves, would prefer personal liberty over any position and whatever level. Somehow Joseph knew by faith that while he was in Egypt, he was also living in the presence of God. In each of the places and the circumstances that we find Joseph in, he lived out his life as being in the presence of a holy God whom he honored and obeyed. His diligence, trustworthiness, Honesty and faithfulness are evidence that Joseph had a godly reverence for the Lord Jehovah, the God who revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and who gave Joseph his genes. Joseph was able, therefore, to see something beyond the marble floors and the fancy tapestry of Potiphar's house. He was able to see more than the seductress on the bed, and he was able to look above the prison walls to see a God whose promises were sure and to trust that this God was alive and at work in his life, no matter what the temporary circumstances seem to suggest. Now, the story feels a bit like a roller coaster, doesn't it? First, there's the devastating plunge, followed by the rapid rise to success. Then there's that place on the high track, and then another plunge, and now a steady climb upwards. It can sound exhilarating if it really were a roller coaster, but mostly in real life, it was just simply hard for Joseph. Joseph found himself in hard places without any personal freedom, no obvious hope for the future, and so certainly no rights to um, uh, seek justice in his own story. Have you ever felt like life was a bit of a roller coaster, or perhaps right now you feel like your life is in a constant free fall downward? Those times of devastating loss or heartbreaking pain or bitter disappointment can trap us up. I certainly have found, and we can be tempted to believe that God is not on our side. He doesn't care, and if he does care, he certainly isn't treating us very kindly. In speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, the Apostle Paul told us in Romans 15, verse 4, that whatever was written in former times was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Joseph's story gives us encouragement to endure under deep and devastating loss. We're encouraged not to measure God by the circumstances in which we find ourselves, but to take hope in God because of the grace in which we stand and in his sure promises to us. In the disappointments, the pains, griefs, losses, loneliness, and the challenges we encounter, we need faith to see that God loves us. We need to avoid looking at things around us like whether our garden flowers are blooming or our bird sings on the deck or our stomach feels well, our clothes are fitting better, our friends are all friendly, our bank account is growing, or whether our children are healthy and well. We need to avoid looking at those things and using them as a measure of whether God cares for us or not. In times of deepest pain and loss, a look to the cross alone will assure us without a doubt that God loves us. The gift of his precious son on the cross to pay for our sins and to buy our pardon before a holy God is abundant evidence that he loves us profoundly and surely more than words could ever tell. It's in reading God's word and being reminded of his promises and tracing his ways in human history that we can be encouraged that God is in control and that his purposes will certainly come to be no matter how confusing and distressing things may be right now. We've talked about where is Joseph? And the question is, where is God through this? So the encouraging thing is that God is right with Joseph. The chapter tells us that a few times, that the Lord was with Joseph Joseph and caused him to prosper in Potiphar's house and in the prison. The Lord gave Joseph favor with Potiphar and with the prison keeper. This must have been sweet to Joseph, to taste the Lord's blessings as he walked through these really painful places in his very hard life. But we read that While we read that the Lord was with Joseph when he came to Egypt, we can also see that he was with Joseph before he came to Egypt, orchestrating the very events that brought him there. 
In chapter 37, we read that Joseph's father sent him to visit his brothers in Shechem. Shechem was an ancient commercial center, and there would have been a lot of people there. But when Joseph got to Shechem, his brothers weren't there. So Joseph was wandering around in a field, and he just happened to meet a man who happened to notice him and happened to ask Joseph what he was doing. This man happened to have overheard Joseph's brothers say that they were going to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan, which was a more remote and a quieter place. Shechem was a place where Joseph's brothers could much more easily commit the crimes against him without being seen or heard. Would Joseph's father have sent him to Dothan if he had known that's where the brothers were? We don't know. But that's where Joseph found himself by God's design. And while his brothers were sitting down to enjoy their lunch with him down in a pit, it just so happened that a caravan of traders happened to pass by. And of all things, they were going to Egypt. His brothers sold him, and Joseph landed in Egypt. So those could all seem like random details, but God tells us that for a reason, so that by faith that we could see that God was actually at work lining up those events to bring Joseph to Egypt and that he was going to go with him the whole way into Egypt. As the story unfolds, we'll see that Joseph is exactly where God wanted him to be by God's good hand. Psalm 105 speaks of the Lord's uh, wonderful deeds and his amazing works to his people. In it, uh, God tells how Joseph fit into the plan. The psalm relates how God made Joseph fit in the plan of his wondrous works, and it says this, God summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread. He had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt in fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him can see very clearly that God orchestrated all of these events. When tragedy hits us, we can be inclined to go over the what-ifs and wonder if maybe some detail could have gone differently and then everything would have worked out differently and this tragedy had not happened. But by faith, we can see that in the Genesis account, it's painting a picture of a God who is working out all the details to bring Joseph to exactly where he needed to be for God to work out a story of grace in Joseph's family. Uh, This reminds me of an old hymn, uh, well, a classic hymn that uh, I used to sing, and this has come to mind to me often in times of trial, and I thought it fit really well in this study of God's good hand. It says, through waves, clouds, and storms, God gently clears the way. We wait his time. Soon will the night end in blissful day. He everywhere has sway, and all things serve his might. His every act, pure blessing is, his path, unsullied light. When he makes bare his arm, who shall his work withstand? When he his people's cause defends, who then shall stay his hand? We leave it to himself to choose and to command. With wonder filled, we soon shall see how wise, how strong his hand. And especially this last... um, thing here. We comprehend him not, yet earth and heaven tell that God sits as sovereign on his throne and ruleth all things well. Now, I know it doesn't always feel that way. I understand that. It doesn't always feel that what's happening is good and that he's ruling well, but faith sees beyond that somehow and believes in a God and in his promises. Joseph saw beyond the momentary affliction and the overwhelming trial in his life to see a sovereign, eternal God in great difficulties rather than resent a God who had allowed bad things to happen to him. Joseph believed God was with him, and he honored the God of his fathers. Joseph knew that God was with him when his position of responsibility with its accompanying honor was ripped from him because of a hideous lie and false accusation, and he was thrown into prison. Even then, Joseph didn't say, why bother serving such a God who treats me so terribly? I resist temptation to honor him, and this is how he rewards me? Joseph, rather, continued to honor the Lord and behave in a way that gave God glory in his life. He, again, was faithful, trustworthy, reliable, and steadfast. Isn't this remarkable? For many of us, when hard times come and when disappointment prevails or losses overwhelm, we're tempted to say, obviously, God doesn't care very much about me if he allows that to happen. 
I don't know for sure where we come up with this idea because the whole of Scripture speaks of godly people suffering much pain and even tells of the perfect, sinless Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, suffering so much painful rejection, persecution, and alienation throughout his earthly life and terrible injustice and horrible torture in his death. Yet rooted deep in our hearts is a belief that if I'm good, good things will happen to me. We, ch we can sometimes assess other people that way. If they're good, good things would happen. So why is this happening? We choose a certain definition of goodness, and then we aim to live by that, and we try to reassure ourselves that we're doing pretty well and we're on the right track. And then trouble, trial, or affliction come to us, and we're shocked because we were so sure we were doing a pretty good job. How can that happen, we wonder. Now, in this thinking, we actually reveal a very pagan idea that is hidden deep in our hearts that considers God to be fickle and temperamental, and we have to do just the right things to please him and to be sure not to upset him. And so if I can, <clears throat> if I can be good according to my definition of goodness, he'll be good to me. But if I upset him, he'll unleash his temper and, on me and my life. We think it's all about being fair. And if I haven't upset him by being naughty, then he should be good to me and give me all the things that are nice and pleasant and sweet. But when we think this way, we show that we think far too highly of our own goodness and much too little of God's great goodness. This is not the example we see in Joseph's life. Joseph had faith to see what was invisible, to look beyond the situation of his life in the present moment and to believe God was still with him, still working and still keeping his promises. Joseph's story wasn't over. And somehow Joseph had the faith to believe God would still things, work things out in his life. So what about you? Are you in a chapter 39 place in your story? Maybe you're suffering from injustice or hatred or you're in pain because of false stories. Maybe you have temptation pressing down on you so hard that it feels like it's breathing down your neck. Maybe you're in a roller coaster of, life, of a life story with dizzying successions of failure and success and you can hardly keep up. Maybe you've been betrayed by family members. Do you feel caught in some hard place that you can't get out of, like Joseph in prison? Well, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage myself. Let's hang on. God isn't done. He is still working. In these Genesis 39 times of our lives, we can take encouragement from Joseph and remind ourselves that God is still with us. We can remind ourselves that it matters to him what we do. We can remind ourselves that he is able to make us succeed in honoring him even when we are mistreated and when everything seems to be going wrong. We can remind ourselves that our story isn't over. We're just in chapter 39. We can keep trusting God. We can keep believing God. There are many chapters ahead, and we will see him work out our story and his story of grace. There is hope. There is help even when it doesn't feel like it. God will be faithful and we can trust him. We're just in chapter 39. There's still so much of the story to be written and God will write it in grace as we continue to trust him and honor him in whatever place or time we're in. So I just want to encourage you to take heart, my dear friends, and trust in God's good hand. Thank you.